You're out of the shop now. I'm going to count down for you. Ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning, everybody, uh, and thank you very much for joining us for a discussion that is long overdue about one of the most important issues facing our country that gets very little discussion here in Congress uh, or in the media. And I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Congressman Brad Sherman, who is from California. And Brad is a senior member of the House Financial Services Committee. Brad, thanks so much for being with us. And we're also join, joined by uh, Simon Johnson, who is the former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. He is currently a professor of entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School of Management, where he also serves as head of the Global, Global Economics and Management Group. Um, Simon, thanks so much for joining us as well. Um, here is what my great fear is, and we're going to touch on that tangentially today, but overall I worry very much that in our nation today we are moving toward an oligarchic form of society where a small number of very wealthy individuals uh, and large corporations have enormous control over our economic and political life. Uh, today we are in a country where three people, three of the wealthiest people, own more wealth than the bottom half of American uh, society, and 52% of all new income is going to the top 1%. Now in the midst of all of that, uh, what we're going to be discussing today uh, is Wall Street, uh, which, in my view, is the most powerful economic and political force in this country. Uh, as we all know, uh, 10 years ago, as a result of the greed, recklessness, and illegal behavior on Wall Street, this country was plunged into the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And it was an unbelievable tragedy for many, many millions of people. Unemployment rate shot up to 10%. Uh, real a fit, on a fit, real unemployment uh, shot up to 17 percent. Uh, at the height of the financial crisis, more than 27 million Americans were unemployed, underemployed, or had given up looking for work. 15 million Americans lost their homes, and uh, many, many people, many millions of people lost their life savings. American households lost over 13 trillion dollars in savings, shattering retirement dreams, wiping out life savings, and making it impossible for families to send their kids to college. In other words, this was a cataclysmic event which had a traumatic impact on the lives of people all across this country. As some of you will recall, on October 3rd, 2008, President George W. Bush signed legislation into law not to help the disappearing middle class but to provide a $700 billion bailout to Wall Street banks because they were too big to fail. And that's the main point we're going to be discussing today, too big to fail. That if they were allowed to go under, they would take much of the economy with them. And that was the rationale for bailing them out. Now, $700 billion is obviously a lot of money. Uh, and if that was all that was provided to Wall Street during the financial crisis, it would amount to the largest taxpayer bailout in the history of the world. But of course, that was not all that was given to Wall Street, not by a long shot. One of the things that we did during the uh, debate over the bailout is that I was able to get an amendment uh, passed uh, to audit the Federal Reserve. Uh, and what we learned, in fact, what is what really went on behind the scenes, above and beyond the $700 billion bailout. We learned that our nation's central bank, the Federal Reserve, provided more than $16 trillion in financial assistance to every major bank in the country, including Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo, not to mention large corporations, foreign banks, and foreign central banks all over the world. Now, one might have thought that as part of the bailout, these huge banks, which were bailed out because they were too big to fail, would have been reduced in size. One might have thought that somebody said, hey, we ain't going to do this anymore. We are going to break you up. Well, needless to say, that did not happen. In fact, what has happened over the years is the very opposite. 
Today, the four largest financial institutions in this country are, on average, 80% larger than they were before we bailed them out. So in other words, they did not shrink in size, but they're today 80% larger. Uh, incredibly, since the financial crisis, J.P. Morgan Chase has increased its assets by more than $1.1 trillion. Bank of America and the other large banks have also significantly increased their assets. Listen to this. Today, the six largest banks in America have over $10 trillion in assets equivalent to 54% of our GDP. Six banks have assets equivalent to 54% of the GDP. Are you comfortable with that? I'm not. And that's kind of the issue that we're going to be talking about today. But it's not only the size of these banks, but within that size, uh, uh, these six financial institutions hold about half of all credit card debt, control over 90% of all bank derivatives, underwrite about a third of all mortgage debt, and control over 40% of all bank deposits. If these banks were too big to fail 10 years ago, what would happen if any of them were to fail today? And that's the issue we're going to be discussing. In my view, and I think you'll hear similar thoughts in a moment, no bank that is too big to fail is too big to exist. So the issue is preventing another collapse, another huge bailout, but there's another issue as well. And that is that not only am I worried about another collapse and bailout, I'm worrying about the lack of competition that we see today as a result of this huge concentration of ownership. And one of the manifestations of that has to do with the outrageously high level of credit card interest rates in this country. Today, while banks borrow money from the Fed at 2%, 2%, they charge consumers an average of about 17% for credit cards. And if you have mediocre or bad credit, interest rates can be as high as 25 or 30%. That's you. That is, millions of people today who may not have great credit, maybe they were unemployed for a while, couldn't pay their bills, paying 25 or 30% to these banks who borrow the money at 2%. I think uh, the time is now. Uh, to break these banks up, and that's what the legislation is about that we're going to discuss. And I'm delighted that uh, Congressman Brad Sherman has been working on this issue for years. And uh, what this bill will do is uh, cap the size of the largest financial institutions in this country so that the total exposure to our economy is no more than 3% of GDP. That's about $584 billion today. Brad, why don't you pick it up from there? Senator, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm Brad Sherman uh, from California's best named city, Sherman Oaks, and for 22 years I've represented most of the San Fernando Valley in Congress, and uh, for 22 years it's uh, been my pleasure to work with uh, you, Senator, particularly on this bill, which we have been working on and reintroducing since 2009. Um, Ten years ago, the largest banks in this country were able to hold us hostage. They said, if we go down, we're taking the entire economy down with us. And as the senator pointed out, they're in a stronger position to do that today because they're almost, uh, they're well over 50% larger than they were then. That bill that was signed into law would have been even worse if it hadn't been for the efforts of the critics. The original plan for TARP was to give the banks the money in return for toxic assets. The worst trash would be converted to cash. The uh, worst mortgages in the biggest vaults in the biggest banks for real money. That would have enriched the banks by almost, by, by the lion's share of the $700 billion. Uh, due to the critics of that proposal, they backed down just a bit. And instead, the $700 billion uh, bailout was structured as an investment in preferred stock. Uh, and uh, as the senator points out, though, that was just one part of the bailout. That bailout, um, was a violation of the social compact that we have in this society. That when capitalists uh, invest, they take the risk and reap the profits. 
And instead, we ended up with uh, socialism for the rich, a form of socialism that nobody here supports, where the taxpayer takes the risk, but of course the enormous profits have gone uh, to, to the banks. Um, this, so what happened then would happen again. Uh, we get the call, you're going to take the entire economy down with us. And Wall Street understands that. That's why the IMF issued a paper saying that the biggest banks are able to borrow money from their creditors at 80 basis points less. Now, 80 basis points, that's eight tenths of one point. Sounds like a trivial amount, unless you apply that to two or three trillion dollars. And the savings, by saving just 0.8 to 1 percent of that, tends to be roughly equivalent to the profits of these banks. So their profits are attributable to the fact that they can borrow money for less because everyone on Wall Street knows if they're going down, they're calling us and the politics of this country, uh, they believe, would le lead us uh, to bail them out again. Now, the idea of breaking up the big banks is not uh, a, some wild, we should have Republicans here. Sorry? It's real capitalism, real competition. And the concept of breaking up the big banks is supported by the Independent Community Bankers Association, which represents 90% of the bank presidents in this country, not known to attend Trotskyite meetings. Um, the, uh, uh, we need real competition that's fair, where medium-sized and regional banks and small banks can prosper without suffering an 80 basis point disadvantage. Because a bailout is not just bad for our economy, it's bad for our judicial system. Because we were told by Eric Holder, these banks are too big to jam. We can't indict any of them without bringing out the economy. And what kind of license does it give bank executives if they feel they're too big to jail? And it was a clear disruption of uh, the social compact uh, in the country. Um, you'd think that wanting to break up the big banks means you're hostile to banks, some might be. But we're doing it for their, for, for a, 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 a capitalist system that works and that's fair, and it's not difficult to do. It, when a protozoa, a one-celled animal, gets too big, it divides in two. And I'm hoping that the geniuses on Wall Street are at least as smart as the average healthy protozoa that they can simply divide themselves into two or three units uh, that will be healthy, that will compete reasonably, and that will not have an unfair competition, uh, competitive advantage. Brad, thanks very much. I'm going to explore your work. Uh, Simon Johnson is not only a leading economist. Uh, he wrote a paper for the Minneapolis Federal Reserve on how to break up the big banks, which forms the basis of the legislation that Brad and I uh, are offering today. Uh, Simon, what's your take on the situation? Well, thank you, Senator and, and Congressman, for taking up this issue. I think it's, it's long overdue. I, I agree completely that uh, what, what we're facing today, 10 years uh, after TARP, is a potential repeat of the same situation, where you look at the, the biggest banks, and we are, I would emphasize, talking about six really big mega banks that will be directly impacted. J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. Any one of those is now at a size great, larger than Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers caused many of the problems in September 2008, as we remember too vividly. If any one of them went down, there would be big knock-on effects across the entire economy globally. And then the officials would come back to you in the Senate and the House, and they'd say, we have to save the world. Right. And you'd be placed in exactly that same impossible position you were placed in end of September, early October. So, uh, 2008. So the only way out of this, and we, I, I, I supported many parts of Dodd-Frank. I think Dodd-Frank has moved some... Um, Dimensions of financial system in a better direction, more competition, more transparency. But it's not enough. It's clearly not enough because the, the biggest banks have become even bigger. The largest bank in 2008 was Citigroup at $2.5 trillion. Now it's J.P. Morgan Chase at $3.5 trillion. Break them up. Make them smaller. Make them more, comp make them more competitive, as, as uh, Congressman Sherman said, and you'll get more of the benefits of competition. And make them smaller politically which is going to address exactly your issues about the oligarchy. One last point, which if I could just emphasize, the top legislation which you, were, you felt which had, to, which had to pass, otherwise the consequences were dire, ended up supporting these large banks, exactly as you said. Where was the bailout for the homeowners? 
Many people had a, experienced a fall in house price and were underwater on their mortgages, couldn't make those payments. If they had been able to finance their positions, those underwater positions, for two to three years like the banks were, they wouldn't have, had to, they wouldn't have been foreclosed on. They wouldn't have lost their house. They would not have gone bankrupt. They would not now face high interest rates, loss of health insurance, and so on. So the bailouts are always, some people call it lemon socialism. The upside is for the oligarchs. The downside is the lemons, which we get. There's no support provided ever to ordinary Americans in this kind of crisis. That's why your legislation is so important to avoid a repeat of that experience. So let me just start off by asking you a question. Given the horrific situation of 2008 and the trauma it caused, and people are still feeling that, that the African-American community was devastated by that, why is there not more discussion of this issue? Why are people not asking the simple question if they were too big to, too big to fail in 2008 and they're bigger today, why do we allow this to continue? Uh, it's, it's a great question, Senator. There's clearly amnesia is, is a problem in this country more, more generally. Look, um, uh, former Fed Chair Alan Greenspan, a Republican as far as I know, in October 2009 said if, it's too big, if they are too big to exist, talking about the banks, too big to exist, they're too big to fail. So at that moment, after the crisis, there was great clarity across right. the political spectrum. But unfortunately, um, uh, you know, various politicians have decided that they like the status quo. There's a lot of money that comes from the banks to politicians on, on both sides of the aisle. The status quo bias is, is extremely strong. And, and people have really just forgotten or, or choose to ignore the, the lessons of 2008. Just to pick up on Simon's point. Mm -hmm. Since the 1990s, the financial sector has given more than $3.2 billion in campaign contributions and last year alone spent over $200 million on lobbying. Maybe that has something to do with the fact, Brett? Right? I think if we get public financing, we'll be in a stronger position to deal with this and a whole lot of issues. Brett, you're on the House Financial Services mm -hmm. Committee. How do you see the power of, of Wall Street related to all of this stuff? Well, uh, we may see a big change, probably the biggest change you've ever seen in a committee. You served on that House Committee for many years. Our current chairman is Jeb Henserling, uh, our future chairwoman is Maxine Waters, uh, if this election goes as we think it will. And I cannot think of a bigger change in the leadership of a committee in the history of our country. Uh, but that being said, uh, Wall Street still, they've got at least four networks dedicated to the worship of Wall Street that people could be watching on their cable systems now. In my area, there are only three channels dedicated to the worship of Jesus Christ. Um, it's not just the money to politicians. It's a national worship of Wall Street, a belief that anything that makes the markets go down is bad for America. Uh, and anything that makes the markets go up, uh, I remember uh, being criticized when in the House we were able to stop this bill for a while and change it. Uh, and the markets dropped uh, 600 points. Right. Well, they've dropped 600 points for a host of other reasons as well. But the idea was you're anti-American because you did something that Wall Street thought. Let me ask both of you a pretty simple question. Uh, what is the likelihood of another crash in Berlin? What do you think? Is that really a likelihood or not so much? I think another crash is absolutely... Uh, Something's going to happen. The, the history of, of you believe well, it will happen. It, I, I'm not saying the, the date, right. but I'm saying you will you will have another major disturbance uh, of the kind that we experienced in in the 2000s. The history of, of the United States, the history of world finance, says these things do not go away. The question is, does the disturbance become a major crisis, the cataclysm or the imminent cataclysm, and then do you have to provide the bailout? There's a choice, and that's what your legislation addresses, which is, yes, we'll have turbulence, yes, we'll have problems, but can we resolve them just with ordinary bankruptcy? And to the congressman's point, I would say, what, what is more American than antitrust? Breaking up Standard Oil, breaking up AT&T, these were not anti-market, anti-capitalist things. Th these also didn't fix up all of our fundamental problems, by the way, but they were things that were completely consistent with more competition and, and a e more even playing field for all Americans who choose to participate in the business. What do you think, Brad? Do you think there's a strong likelihood of another crash? At some point, um, we'll see what Dodd-Frank does instead of breaking up the big banks is try to make them um, less risky which might delay the time that it happens. It's like uh, 
throwing the dice at Vegas and being told, well, you don't crap out with a three or a two, you only crap out with a two. So um, you'll be able to play the dice longer, but eventually... Um, you're All right, above out. and beyond uh, the fear of another collapse, what does it mean from a competitive point of view? What, I'm the average consumer, who cares? What do I care if there's one bank or 50 banks? What does it mean to me that you have so few banks controlling so much, so many assets and, and such a large part of the economy? Well, as you said, Senator, there's concerns about the high interest rates. We've already seen a lot of price fixing in, in the London interest rate um, uh, market. Uh, that, that was a huge scandal. Has it been fixed? Perhaps a little bit on the margins. Are these big players going to cook up some other version that they can also manipulate? Almost certainly, right? The pattern of behavior is that these very large banks get out of control. They abuse the consumers. Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo extraordinary. Do you story. see any fundamental change in the behavior of large banks since 2008? No. <laughs> right. Now, that's an important point. Absolutely Let's stay not. on that one. In other words, did they learn their lesson and become good boys and girls? No, of course not. They kept their heads down for a while. There was a little bit of pressure. But by September 2009, they were back at the same games. It didn't. The Obama administration let them off the hook. They gave them the top money. Top capital with very, very, very few strings attached. Mm -hmm. For Wall Street, that's just a good trade. They're like, great, we made this money. We handed, we handed off some of the downside to the taxpayer. Let's get on with it. The particular thing, which was mortgages being given to people without documentation, etc., I don't think they'll make that exact mistake again. But that doesn't mean uh, there aren't a hundred other ways uh, to milk them. And that's the history of financial crises. You find another way to melt down based on whatever newfangled craziness is in fashion. All right, what does it mean, and Brad, you raised this issue, uh, what does it mean that despite the fact that many of these large banks had to pay very, very heavy fines, no major Wall Street figure was jailed? What is that? What's your sense of What does it tell the American people? That the people who cause so much pain and uh, instability in this country and world. None of them got a police record. What does that, what does that say? None of them even got indicted. None of them uh, got a suspended sentence. No one got even close to that process. And it means that a certain class of folks is uh, above the law. I hate to sound cynical, but they made money on the trade. If you look at the compensation received by the top financial executives in 2000, 2008, and you include whatever hand slaps there were subsequently, which are incredibly minor at the personal level, they made money on the trade. That's all they care about. They do not care at all about anyone else. They're in it for themselves. They're in it for the money. It was a good trade. They want to find a way to do it again. And, and on, on, the, on the point about the fines paid by the companies, they may look big in terms of headlines, but for the individuals involved, it's zero. And who do they find? They find the stockholders, <laughs> the people who were taken advantage of on the last cycle. It makes no sense. Well, they also have the propaganda point where they can say, look at this bank president or executive, they lost their job. And the average person relates to that and says, gee, if I lost my job, I couldn't pay the rent. I'd be desperate. That is a huge punishment. But they walk away with $100 million. You know, if you're unemployed with $100 million, it's not so bad. Right. And then you could pay the rent, right? Right. All right. Um, so, I mean, what have we not gone over? I, I think we've covered it, uh, Senator. I, I think that the, the heart of the matter is an oligarchy. An oligarchy that is multidimensional across many sectors, but it is absolutely manifest and, and, and very dangerous in the financial sector through the form of these very large banks. It's a, it's a strange oligarchy in the sense that their most devastating power comes when they threaten to fail. Because then they're basically giving you, you know, either you support us, which is awful, or you have global cat cataclysm. Right. And, and they come to you, they'll come to you, as they did in September 2008, the responsible people from the administration, and, and people uh, with a lot of experience, Republicans and Democrats, will say, those are the choices. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. Oh, but only if you reinforce everything else that's been done with a hard size cap, which is all legislation. Right. And we're suffering from this now. It's not just when the crash. As the senator points out, you've got the high interest rates. Uh, but I'm, I'm an old CPA, and uh, it worked with a lot of small businesses. Small businesses are able to get loans from small and medium-sized banks. Uh, I, we had Jamie Dimon testify before us, and he said, we couldn't find businesses in the United States to lend money to, which means he hadn't visited any of our districts. Is that, uh, did he really say that? Therefore... He sent the money to, to his London office where it was eaten by the whale. 
you'll remember the, 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 the trade and they lost uh, many, many billions of dollars. They could have been uh, lending that money to small businesses, but that's not their focus. If you're sitting on the 70th floor and, and, and on Wall Street, you're not thinking, how can I lend money to a pizzeria in Omaha? So uh, if we can get more of the deposits and more of the power closer to small business, uh, I think the economy will work better. Absolutely. This legislation is very strongly supportive of community banking. And, and as you said, the Independent Community Bank of America have consistently supported this kind of size cap because they understand that the very big banks damage them day in, day out, and they damage them even more when there's a crisis. All right. For obvious reasons, some of which uh, we touched on this morning, you're not going to hear this discussion too much on CBS or NBC or ABC. And you're certainly not going to see it on CNBC or the Fox Business Channel or Bloomberg. Or on the floors of the Congress, I must say, as well. All right. So it is up to the American people uh, to begin to stand up and start this discussion. Again, none of us are naive. We understand the power of Wall Street we understand their ownership of many members of the Congress and the media and so forth and so on. But this discussion has got to take place now, or else we are going to find ourselves where we were 10 years ago today, with that devastating moment when the economy virtually collapsed and so many people were thrown out on the streets and lost their homes and lost their life savings. We cannot allow that to happen again. And we cannot allow so few people to have so much power. We can't continue a situation well, ordinary people have to pay 15, 20 percent interest rates, you know, because they may have lost their job or whatever. That's just usurious. That's not acceptable. So this is an, is an issue where serious discussion has got to take place, and we hope you, the viewers out there, will help us with that discussion. Get on the phone. Call up your members of Congress. Find out how they feel about this issue, if they are prepared to take on Wall Street and prevent another major collapse uh, in a bailout. Gentlemen, anything else? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good. Great. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Great. There's one related issue I want to see if you can get involved in. Okay. That's the bond rating agencies. Oh, yeah. They gave. Just never go.